Just letting you know, I'm, if, if I'm not here, it doesn't necessarily mean everything's a calamity. I just need to be there. So, All right, Luke chapter number 14. Do my best to try to stay off of this. It's hard not to be preaching about it when you're going through it. Um, and so uh, if you would take your Bible, look in Luke chapter 14. You're familiar with the passage here about the Great Supper, but I'm going to come at it in a little bit of a different angle if you'll tolerate me here for just a little while this morning. Verse 16 then said he unto him, a certain man bade a great supper and bade made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant to supper time to say to them that were bidden to come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one excuse, consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray, have thee me have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. He didn't even make an excuse. He just said, I'm, I'm married, it ain't happening. You know, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty rude. At least the other one said, hey, I got to do this for a reason. He's like, I married a wife, get it? You know, so... So the servant came and showed the, his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets, the lanes in the city, and bring hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done that thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Brother Larry, take us to the throne room, please. Father, thank you. It sounds so repetitive, Lord, but we do thank you continually, Lord, for being here for this place at 3857 with what you provided. Uh, and we're, we're, we're grateful, Lord, first of all, in this prayer, the Lord, that uh, we don't have to ask to come into your presence, Lord, for we feel you here. And we're so grateful and don't want to take it ever for granted for your presence here. Thank you for the songs that we've sung. Lord, I thank you for an old-fashioned type setting. Amen. God, the old, the old songs of the of the faith. And Lord, uh, even even sung from folks uh, even of the aged. And we praise your name for that. We thank you, Lord, that the young people as well can hear these songs Amen. that lift you up and glorify your precious name. We come to the meeting. I pray for your man. I pray for your preacher, our preacher, God. I lift him up before you. And God, it be it's the best we know how to utter words. Uh, Lord, we ask you for help for him. I pray you preach him. I pray the words that you've given him in message. I pray they be vivid on his mind. God, I pray his his voice will be clear. I pray his crawl would have that build up in him of the Spirit of God. I pray you'd use him one more time. We thank you for what you do in this place. I know there's other places to get preaching. I know there's other churches, and I pray for those that are, that are Bible believing uh, churches preaching today, but we're here, and we need you. Yes. All the events of our life, the circumstances, I thank you, Lord, that you're a great comforter. Amen. And I think you give us exactly what we need every time we meet here. Amen. And we're going to raise you up and lift you up and point you out today. May, your fo may the focus be totally on you. Use your man and word in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Generally, the way we go about the passage is you take a look at those three things and say the excuses are of no count or they're of none accord. They're silly excuses. But I want to go a little bit further than just saying that this morning. I'd like to say this. Oftentimes, when we look at the passage, we don't consider the one who's made the preparation. We don't pause and think that before he went to ask, he realized that what he was doing was asking for the purpose of being able to determine to make sure that everything and everyone that was there had all of their needs met. In other words, they had the ability to, when they showed up there, the right amount of salad and the right amount of hors d'oeuvres, the right amount of, uh, of the main course, the right amount of desserts, the right amount of things along those lines, all of that stuff being laid out, the responsibility for doing that was on the master of the house. If you can imagine that once he went out there, he was very well known and no one would want to turn down an invitation to go to that 
of the, that big huge event that was going to transpire, that event that was going to take place there. And once they all said they would come, they basically put their name in and said, I'll be glad to be there. They've RSVP'd. Is that a good way to say that? They've said, I'm coming, count me in, get my plus one, whatever it might be, and gave him the numbers. And immediately what happens is the master of the house begins to take count of those numbers and said, what do I need to do to make sure we have enough room at the table and make sure that all all the needs are met for these individuals, much like you did when it came time for us to have the Jubilee. I mean, I know you were absolutely surprised by the fact that I prayed for 800 and 600 showed up, but I mean, I guess I was a little off, but still 600 people that you flipped things around and prepared everything from toilet tissue to forks and knives and all the other things that came along with that and made that transition, it required a lot of effort to be able to do that and then at nighttime flip the thing around and get it ready to go again for the next morning and then at the end of the morning get it ready to go again for the nighttime. It required a lot of effort, much like at a wedding. The wedding itself is really not as big of a deal as the reception is. You say, why? Well, the wedding, you roll out a runner, you have a wedding rehearsal, uh, the preacher says a few things, and, and it's pretty much done after the pictures are taken, right? And there's usually plenty of room for everybody to sit. But when it comes time for the reception, you're starting to talk major dollars. I mean, that's why oftentimes they have a funeral at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That way you don't have to worry about trying to feed people lunch after they're finished with the funeral service. You say, why? Repass can be expensive. When people come by after the service is over, that's kind of humorous if you think about it, but expenses become a part of the equation. It costs a lot to put on this. And of course you realize the picture is, here's the Lord who's paid a great price in order to even give you an opportunity, John 14, the mansion that's there for you, for you to even be able to come and to sit at that table. He's had to pay a great price. But can I say this to you? The time that it took for him to prepare this place in context, have you ever paused to consider that when these individuals say, hey, I'm coming, and then they said, I've changed my mind, something came up, that they never considered the preparation that was made the expectation, the expectancy of them arriving, they never pause to say, hey, you know what? However much it costs you to prepare a place for me, I'm willing to reimburse you because I'm not able to be able to be there. Now how often? I don't know. You probably get them in the mail on a regular basis where you tell somebody, <coughs> excuse me, you tell somebody that you'll plan on being at their wedding or maybe at their graduation or something along those lines and they make preparations for you to be there. And then the time comes for you to be there and something else has come up and now all of a sudden they've planned on you being there and now you send back to them if you even bother to contact them and say, I can't come. Have you ever not only considered the preparation that was made, but have you ever considered the feelings of the one that prepared it? you ever think for just a moment how it must make the individual where you were so excited to say, I'll be glad to be there, and yes, count me in and I'll be there, and then to simply say, you know, sorry, something else, something, in it's minuscule to the ever, whatever the excuse is, I'm never even considering the feelings of the person that's no longer going to be able to be there. You say, well, well, I didn't really care enough. Something else that I wanted to do came up and was better than what I was going to do when I was there. I don't know if you've ever paused to even ponder or even think about it for just a moment that when the Lord first sent out His servant and said, hey, tell them to come, it's now ready, that every one of them had one thing in common. They were ready when they were first asked to come. But now they're not ready. If I were to title this, I would say, I'm not ready now. Or I'm not ready yet. Remember the man over there in Luke chapter number 12? You have a, a, a parable there, the story where the Lord goes there and He says the rich man goes out there and, and his harvest has come in and he has to tear down. He's looking at his harvest. He doesn't have enough room to put all the food and stuff in, that's in there. And he sits back there after the harvest comes in and he looks and he says, Man, I'll tell you what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to build bigger barns and I'm going to have to do more because if I keep having this kind of yield on my crops, man, my barns aren't big enough to hold them. I'll build bigger barns. 
And the Lord steps into that parable. You know what He says? Thou fool, knowest not that tonight thy soul shall be required of thee? I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready now. Pausing, contemplating, saying that when you got saved and you chose to do something for the Lord, suppose the Lord were to shorten the time. We oftentimes don't even think of that. We think, well, Lord, that means I'll get saved and then I'll serve the Lord until I get to be old and then when I get old and decrepit and I'm, I'll take control of how... You can't take control of how you die. That's in God's hands. And when you die, that's in God's hands. I understand the, the exceptions to the rules, ladies and gentlemen, but what you have to recognize is, is that we're so quick to say, I'm ready to go if I can go right now. But after a while, things begin to get in our way and things begin to be, make life more complicated and, and we become more uh, uh, slow to say, well, I'm ready to go, but you know, if I could just get this done first, I, I need to get this built. I need to get this promotion. I need to get married. I need to have children. I, I, I need to have this this car. I need to have this p place. I, I need to, whatever you fill in the blank with, and if the Lord were to come to you tonight and say, hey, tonight, Lord, I'm ready. Just not right now. I have so many other things that I want to do. That chicken comes home to roost. Are you really ready? I mean, if you read over there, we go a little bit further in Luke chapter number 16 there. And when you come in that passage on Luke chapter number 16, you have two guys there that die on the same day, a rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man in hell lifts up his eyes and says to, to the Abraham, he says, send Lazarus to dip his finger in the, in the water and come cool my tongue for I'm tormented in the flame. And Lazarus is over in Abraham's bosom. Neither one of them had the opportunity. The rich man, I guarantee you, didn't think he'd die the same day as the beggar died. Right. Nonetheless, I'm ready. Just not right now. I can remember times in my own life that I felt like the Lord was dealing with me about certain things and I tried to sort of make deals and tried to say, now Lord, I'll be willing to do that if I could go ahead and do it. And I made a commitment. And then the Lord didn't have me do something with it at the moment. And then later on, as if a trial was coming my way to say, hey, you remember you told me you'd be willing to go to so-and-so well, uh, yes, sir, Lord. Uh, but that was then. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm busy now. I got other things going on now. I got things that matter more to me now than the commitment I made when I didn't have all these things of such great importance. Maybe you're not in that fashion, but it doesn't take long. Listen, it's easy to make a commitment when you don't have anything to commit. That's why it's so important that if the Lord deals with you about a calling, whether it's to the mission field or to preach or to school, it's good for you to go ahead and act upon it then. You say, why? Because stuff gets in the way. And then the Lord says, hey, how about now? And you're like, Lord, I, I, but you said you'd come. You said you would come. It's ready. Come on. Uh... Lord, I'd like to, but listen, I, I bought this piece of land and I, I really need to go see what I bought. What would you do, buy it in the dark? <laughs> the, the, the intention of the parable is to show you how silly any of our excuses are that the master of the house has prepared now a great feast, a great banquet, and he's done it, and you're going to be the guest of honor. And he's now said, okay, you said you'd come. I got it ready. Come on. And how quickly we're saying, Lord, I'd love to, but you know what? I know it's Sunday, but I just have something else to do, somewhere else to be, and something else to see. Lord, I got I to gotta check a piece of land. That may sound like a good excuse to you, but I guess no matter what, if you don't want to go, any excuse will do. Because it doesn't really matter. The fact is, is that you've changed from the time you said you would to the time that He asked you to come. I want to ask you this morning, if the Lord were to call you, I, listen, I pray for the rapture. I wish now, especially now, I think it would be great. 
I mean, the window opens up next week. I'll be starting to pray and ask the Lord, you know, about 6 o'clock on uh, Saturday night for the Lord to blow the horn and us get out of here. That's when he came out of the tomb and run that thing for 50 days and pray every single day all the way up through Pentecost and all that. Well, why do you do that? I think the Lord's going to come in the springtime. He could come anytime. I pray that the rapture would happen. You say, why? We all get to go together. You know the hard thing to go is, is He's not dealing with everybody here. He's dealing with individuals. He's saying the time to come is now for you. It's your time. That's a rough row to hoe. Get row, right? You understand that? You know, like we're talking about a garden? That's a rough road to hoe. You say, why? It's, it's, it's hard ground. It's got a lot of weeds in it. It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. In here, ladies and gentlemen, he's not talking about a crowd or a nation. He's talking about an individual. He's saying to you, I've decided that I'm ready for you to come home now. Are you ready? Lord, I'm ready to go. I can't wait to go. Man, I sure would love to see you, man. I can't wait to hear him say, boy, I've just seen Jesus. Boy, what a blessing. Can't wait to get there. Okay, good. Come on, let's go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ho, wait. Hold on. I, don't, I didn't mean right now. I'm ready, just not right now. This doesn't fit in with my plan. This isn't how I drew it up. I'm not in control. I told you when I would come, I expected you to sort of give me a little heads up so that I would find out if it fits in my daytimer. You know what I've learned about the Lord? I've learned that death can't be put on a daytimer. I've learned that with a phone call, with a conversation, life can change instantaneously and everything that you had planned, all of a sudden it's like, you don't have control over that anymore. Right. No matter how hard you plan, you say, what are you pushing me for? I'll jump to the end, then I'm going to come back to the middle, okay? I hope the rapture happens soon. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, if history is proving itself, we may have a ways to go yet. Yeah. I hope not. Amen. I don't figure it all out and figure out how many years. I'm all for you doing all that stuff. Here's what I'm here to say to you. It, ladies and gentlemen, that's something that affects us corporately. What if God said to you today, supper's ready, ready to come to the house? Not just ready, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense of I'm saved, I know where I'm going when I die. Are you ready to meet your Savior, Jesus Christ, today and say, if He puts a time stamp on me today and said, that's the end of your life as you know it, are you ready to meet Him today? Well, uh, preacher, hold on just a minute. I know, I know, you're ready when you got saved. Just not now. Don't have any control over the now. If He chooses for that to transpire or for that to take place, it won't matter about your materialistic holdings or whatever your dreams, ambitions were, whatever your, your idea about promotions were, however you drew it up. All of a sudden the Lord said, I'm ready for you to come home now. Would you be ready? Oh, preacher, nobody's really ready. I can tell you by that statement, you're not ready. You're ready in the sense of eternity. You're ready to miss hell. But you know what? You don't realize the seriousness of the fact that the Lord has been up there and has prepared a place for you. You are going to be the bride of Christ for all of eternity. You are going to be set apart and become more and more rare, as one fellow said, and more and more rare as time goes on. And you're going to meet your Savior and you're not in control of the timeline. And if he said today, hey, supper's ready for you. Come on to the house. Would you be ready? Would you say, Lord, uh, I, I know I said I would come and I know I've told you repeatedly that I'm ready to go. Why, Lord, you know, the last funeral I was at, I said, thank God I'm saved. Thank God I, I, I'm ready when that comes. Yeah, but when, rush, when, when push comes to shove, when the rubber meets the road, is there something on your heart today that needs to be jettisoned before you meet Him tomorrow? Is there something that you would 
hate to go ahead and go to heaven today and have to square it up with Him once you got there. I hate to tell you, the misconception is, is that even though my sins are forgiven, they're far as the east is from the west, the idea that if I just die and I haven't confessed my sins, then I get to heaven, it's all good. It is as far as your salvation is concerned, but you're going to have to square up accounts with the Lord when you get there. You're ready, right? Just not today. You're ready in the sense of eternity. You're ready in the sense of your soul being saved. But are you ready in the sense of the judgment seat? Is it real enough to recognize that when you're checking the silk in the casket, when the final day has come, when you finally have, quote, come to rest, that you didn't control how you went out. The Lord reached down and decided on that particular day to go ahead and stop. Excuses are gone. Your heart stopped. What are you going to do now? You're going to stand there and face Him. You, there's no other, nothing else you can do. But there's going to be some things you're going to wish you had done. And there's going to be some of the petty foolishness, just like these petty excuses that when you step into the presence of pure holiness and pure goodness and pure love, that you're going to feel like, man, I don't belong here. Amen. And some of the things that you made such a big deal out of, all of a sudden shrink and the despair will overtake you, and the tears will begin to fall, and you will begin to say, Lord, I was ready, but just not now. And some of the things that we wind up thinking at the last minute because we've watched far too many movies, and way too many YouTube videos, we have too many things that are preconceived non-biblical notions in our mind that says, well, it'll all be good when the time comes. I've got plenty of time. Notice in the passage that he didn't give him a warning for when it occurs. He just says, dinner's ready, let's go. Supper's ready. You said you'd come, come on. Can I say this to you? From the time you get saved, ladies and gentlemen, until where you are now, you have no control over how many things will jump in the way and you do not know what will divert your attention from the most important thing. You know what? I've got some things going on here, but the Lord might call me at any minute. If he calls me, I have to drop it. One individual said to, wrote, I think it was Ann Landers, I got the illustration from somewhere, I think it was Ann Landers, what do you do if uh, the President of the United States asks you to come to a state dinner and you have a conflict on your calendar? Her reply was, there is no conflict. If the President of the United States asks you to come to dinner, there is no conflict, you go to the President. Well, you go to the one that you were singing about, your pilot, as you heard. And if he decides to call you, you know what you got to be doing? you got to be ready to go. In other words, you're living your life as if at any moment he's going to say, Supper's ready. Amen. Yeah, but preacher, I'm only 18. That's not in the passage. Preacher, I'm only 15. That's not in the passage. Preacher, I'm not married yet. That's not in the passage. Preacher, I haven't achieved what I need to achieve. I haven't made my mark in society. Not in the passage. You said you'd come. And he's the one that said, all right, come on. Oh, I'd love to turn the tables and make it about the Gentiles that get in and the highways and the hedges and the blind and the lame and, and those kind of things that get to fill up those slots. And I know where it fits dispensationally, but what I'm trying to drive home to you this morning is none of us are in control of the end date, the expiration date. Doesn't matter how clean you live, he lived a perfect life and died at 33. Yes. There's no guarantee. Our reason for living a clean life is so that if He says supper's ready, we're ready and washed up. We don't have to get cleaned up before time for supper. We're ready and living our life as if at any minute, supper's ready. I'm ready to go. Honey, if uh, the master of the house calls and I'm out in the field, 
and he says, supper's ready, I just want you to know I'm not coming by the house. I'm going to the master's house. Honey, I want you to know if I'm on the road or in an airplane somewhere, if I'm over across or overseas and, and the master of the house, he calls, I want you to know I'm going to the dinner table. Amen. I'm not coming by the house. You can't count on me to come back home. Maybe she might say, honey, uh, while you're gone, the master of the house said, supper's ready. I just want you to know, love you, I'm going to supper. I'll see you at the supper table. I think the thing that is ringing the bells in my heart of hearts is, is the misconception that we have plenty of time. And so much preaching is done nowadays. It is such a waste of air in talking about things that are going on in the here and now and the right now as if we have the ability to change anything since it was like in the days of Noah. Instead of recognizing that as a Christian, we are to be ready when the master of the house calls and said, Hey, supper is ready. Hey, I'm dropping whatever I'm doing. Time for me to go to supper. Well, I didn't get an invitation. <laughs> you better get one while you can. I'm out of here. See you later. I've watched them go. I've seen the Lord ring the dinner bell. You know what's odd? He must be feeding in shifts up there. You ever notice that? He must feed in shifts. You say, why? Well, he doesn't take everybody at the same time. Oh, it is so easy to let something so silly get between you and Him. It may not be land. It may not be oxen. It might be bitterness. It might be anger. It might be wrath. It might be hatred. It might be strife. It might be emulations. It might be jealousy. It might be hurt feelings. It might be something that says, Hey, I'm ready, just not now. I'm not going now. The Lord said, Well, you're not in control of that. As a matter of fact, when you read down through the passage, you know what you find out? When the servant comes back and says, Hey, uh, Lord, I just want you to know, I, I went in and talked to him, and I told everyone that you asked to come, that supper was ready. And he goes, okay, well good. There must have been enough in the original invitation that it would have filled the entire house. Because he said after he went back out there, he said, Master, there's still room. Isn't that interesting? That means his first invitation would have encompassed enough people to have filled the Master's house to the full. You say, well, what was the problem? It wasn't the preparation. It wasn't the invitation. It was the people who made a promise and then took it back and said, I'm ready and I appreciate the invitation. And as long as nothing else comes up, I'll be there. But if something else happens, somebody makes me mad. I get in a twist over something and get my eyes off of Jesus. Forget about it. I'm not coming. Can I point out to you the manipulation of the people that are here? Can I say to you that their absence is speaking volumes and it is an attempt on the part of those individuals to say, you are not going to tell me when supper time's ready. You're going to feed me when I'm ready to be fed. And I'll let you know when that time is. Oh, how often, how many times has that occurred for Christians? You're just going to sin for a little season. Why? If the Lord rings the dinner bell during the supper, you know what you're saying? I don't care. No matter to me. I'll let Him know when I'm ready to go. What if the Lord were to call you today? Are you ready? Uh, look, I'm not the one dying right now. I mean, I'm, I'm dying in a sense, but I'm not the one dying right now. I'm not thinking I'm going to meet Him tomorrow. But what if I did? I don't know what it must feel like to somebody who has this constant thought and had been told, your time is now limited. What would you change? Supper time's approaching. 
You think you can let maybe some of those things that you're holding on to as if you have eternity remaining? Do you think you can let those things go, jettison those things to be ready if supper time comes tonight? Would it even be possible to allow such silly excuses to stand between you and Him at the judgment seat of Christ as if He's been a bad God, a bad Father, a bad provider, an individual that hasn't done what He promised to do all the days of your life and yet chooses to all of a sudden say, Supper's ready! We had a rule in my house. You probably find that hard to believe after hearing the stories about my dad. We came home, had to get our homework done if we weren't playing ball or something. Homework was first. And then it was get out of the house. You, don't, you ain't staying in the house. You get out of the house, you go play in the woods, you go play down the road or whatever. Now I realize times are different. We didn't have pedophiles riding around the car picking up people and that kind of thing. Because back in those days, if they caught you out there, they never saw you again. Amen. So I've been told. But we didn't have the problem like now because... There, there was not anybody that was kind of leaning that way. If you were leaning that way, <laughs> that tree done fell over. And all of a sudden, what happened to that leaner? I, I'm just saying. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Now it's like tolerated. Nowadays, you got to like put a beeper on your kid to make sure, you know, where's the kid going? All of a sudden, they're speeding up. It's like somebody done picked them up, you know. It wasn't that way. It was get out of the house. But here was the rule. Number one, you better be close enough to hear me whistle, boy. When I drive in the driveway at nighttime and say, that meant you better not be so far you can't hear me whistle. And that means you better jump on that swing bicycle with them gooseneck handlebars and that banana seat and them little playing cards down there. You better be paddling like nobody's business and you better be tearing up stumps to get back to the house. You say, why? Supper's ready. Daddy, I ain't done playing yet. Supper's ready. You want to get him upset. You know what happened? You get your hind end tore up for, for not being where you're supposed to be. Daddy, I didn't hear you. That ain't my fault. Amen. You know what it taught me? It taught me you better be close enough to be able to hear the whistle, not see how far I could get and still hear the whistle. I had to stay close enough so I made sure I heard the whistle. You say, why? He didn't whistle more than once. If you didn't show up, that car would be coming down the road. Boy... Uh-oh. And man, you all of a sudden, you lost your appetite. You didn't care about what was for supper. You didn't care if it was meatballs and sketty sauce. You didn't make it. If it was roast beef and mashed potatoes and English peas and biscuits, man, all of a sudden, it's like something is in your stomach. And you're like, I'm going to throw up. He's like, put your bicycle in there. Better still, I'll follow you. And he's right behind you and you're... It's like he's herding you back. And you get in there and you have to put it all up. You ever been there before? Supper's ready. You say what? It was my responsibility to stay within earshot. Yes. Yes. And my responsibility to come when he whistled. I didn't even get any choice. He just said, when I whistle, you better come running. I look at that right now and I think to myself, if the Lord whistled me up today, oh, I'd love to tell you. I'd love to tell you. Oh, I'm ready. Can't wait to see Jesus and, and get raptured out of here. Oh, what a glorious thing. But in my heart of hearts, I look in my life and I say, are you really ready? I mean, boy, that's such a good facade to put on, isn't it? I mean, I'm ready as far as my salvation is concerned. Do you understand? I know I'm saved. You say, well, you don't act like it. I'm glad you're not the judge. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, I find out real quick how ready I am when just the slightest little wind begins to blow and it upsets my plans and my timeline. I'm, I'm strange about that. I actually am a list maker. I know, you find that hard to believe, right? It's kind of like, really, imagine that, you know? I keep a timeline. I write things down. I have an order to things. I have an order to the way I study. 
And she'll even make fun of me. She'll come up there and say, what you're doing right now is like somebody coming up there and moving all your books out of this and that and the other and, and make an illustration. You say, why? I can tell you where the books are in my library and what shelf they're on and what book you need to go to to pull out what illustration it is that you need because they're where I put them up the last time I used them. She said, well, that's ridiculous. Okay, well, you do whatever works for you. I'm just telling me. But you know what happens? Somebody comes in and borrows a book. <laughs> and immediately I'm like, it's a satanic attack. <laughs> the devil came in here and rearranged my books. And I make a plan every day for what I'm going to do during the day. And then all of a sudden, something happens, the phone rings, and literally at a phone call, my whole life changes. Literally, my life changes. I thank the Lord so much for how He brought me up since I was 19, having my life always at someone else's beck and call, and my life was controlled by the needs of other people. You say, what was that? The preacher said that was ministerial training for me, and that I must have been a really slow student because it took me over 20 years to learn what most people learn in three. That's what he said. That's funny. <laughs> but when all of a sudden I have these plans, and the Lord says, Supper's ready. I got something I want you to do. It's outside of your norm. It's a, a, a dovetail that's going to branch off over here. But it's important to me. Can I interrupt your schedule? Man, you talk about a tailspin. And then I find out how my relationship is with Him. Can He really control me? How many things would I have to offload if I stood up there at the gate and before I hit the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord says, anything you want to talk about? I've been thinking about that. Anything you want to talk about? You know, the misconception is, maybe not for you, but for me, is that I'll have plenty of time to fix all that. I think sometimes I'm more Catholic than I want to believe. I think it's like I'm going to be able to like give last rites. Brother Sam's going to come in and say, Preacher, is there anything you want to tell me? <laughs> yeah, get away from me with all them crosses, man. <laughs> God bless the preacher and forgive him of all these things he's now confessed to me. I, I think sometimes that I think I got that time. You know what's odd is, is that I've been very familiar with sudden supper time. Supper's ready now. Well, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I wanted to get washed up. I wanted to get fixed up. I wanted to get my do on, you know. I wanted to get go see Brother Mitch, get trimmed up, right? New shop. And then I'm ready for supper. Lord, uh -uh. Supper's ready. You come like you are. That means I always have to stay in a state of preparedness. Amen. You just got that. I got to always be living my life as if He's going to call me to supper today, in the next hour. And if I do that, guess what happens? I don't have to worry about making excuses. I've been through this passage before and I, I look at it and I think to myself, how silly these illustrations are, how silly these excuses are. And eventually, you know what happens? The Lord says, and how silly are your excuses? And these are people that are saved under the law and don't get near what I've given you. And this is their silly excuses for not coming to suffer. And oh yeah, I'm angry with them because I paid the same price for them that I paid for you. But imagine if I paid that price for you and I call you to supper and you're not ready. How silly would your excuse be? I heard an old preacher preaching one time. He was actually preaching about the judgment seat and he was doing a really good job. I mean, it was kind of, it was, it was like pretty much like right down the pipe. And he wasn't hitting all the sins of the flesh and all the stuff, you know, smoking and drinking and cussing and all that kind of a deal. He was just talking about being ready at the judgment seat of Christ. And he said, you know what? There's two things I'd like to say. He was a pauser, an effective pauser. He said, there's two things I'd like to say. 
It's irritating, isn't it? I'm like, shoot, man, say it. It's like Percy Ray said, the problem with you dehydrated Baptist. Did the tape break? What? What's my problem? This guy's a pauser. Two things I'd like to say. You're taking. Number one, whatever reason you have not to come to Jesus Christ today, take out a piece of paper and write it down. Stick it in your pocket. And when you meet the Lord at the great white throne judgment, He had His judgments right. He said, I want you to reach in that pocket and pull out that excuse. And whatever that excuse is, you show it to Him and say, not today. And I thought, that's a pretty effective illustration. And then he said, and as for you Christians, blood washed, born again, King James only, Bible believers rightly dividing. If the Lord were to ring the dinner bell today, what excuse would you write down? to not be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. I was mad. Somebody hurt my feelings. I was bitter. I was angry. He listed them. And I thought, you know, the second one of those two will fit me. The first one I'm not worried about. I'm saved since I was seven. I'm ready to go, just not. Now. I don't want to be at the point where I'm ready to go because things have gotten so bad that for me to stay is more painful than it is for me to go. I want to go out high-stepping. I want to go out in good health. I want to go out breathing. I don't want to go out some decrepit, old, beat-up old saint if the Lord sees fit. Oh, look, I'm not trying to be blasphemous. But in my heart, I want to be as ready to go healthy as I would be if I wasn't healthy. Is it making any sense to you at all? You're ready, aren't you? Just not today? What about the kids that will be left behind? What about the grandkids that will be left behind? What about the husband? What about the wife? What about the business? What about the job? What about the money? What about the car? What about this? What about that? What about, what about, what about, what about? And the Lord's like, well, what about the guy that prepared supper? Amen. How silly will our excuses be when we finally get hauled up there to the judgment seat of Christ? And the Lord said, the Bible says, and they all began to make excuse. Their excuses are not even valid excuses. I want to ask you a question. Do you live your life as if today could be the last day? Does it even cross your mind? Can I say this to you? Until really recently, in spite of some of the things I've seen and done and been a part of and so on and so forth, can I say this to you? I won't really say that I think about going home every day. See, preacher, that's kind of like a little bit weird thinking about why. Why is that weird? I mean, sooner or later, we go the way of all the earth, right? What would be wrong with saying, Lord, if today's the day, I don't want to have all these superfluous, foolish, stupid things. I want to talk to you about real stuff. And not silly stuff. He has to wait on the judgment seat when we get up there for everybody to be there. Why? He has to reserve, per, resolve personal conflicts. Can you imagine that? Of all the things going on in glory, He has to get a couple of saints together to get them on the same page. You say, preacher, what a silly excuse. No more silly than I got land, I got oxen, I got a wife. If the Lord were to call whistle today, a whistle today and call you to supper, would you be ready? You can be. That Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That Bible says that you can be ready right now if He were to blow the horn today,
or if He were to decide to stop your heart today, or if He were to allow you to be run over today, or He were to give you a diagnosis today. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says you can be ready for supper no matter what time of the day He calls it. If you go ahead right now, right now, and you say, you know, Lord, there's some things I need to get squared away. I've sort of let some dust build up on some things. There's some cobwebs in the innermost recesses of my heart. Some things have gotten in the way, Lord. I, I, I'm ready for supper, just not now. If you'll let me finish these things first. It's interesting that you don't go but two chapters. You come to the end of that thing in Luke chapter number 14, and He said, Whoso loveth mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, uh, children, yea, his own life also cannot be my disciple. You don't go but a couple of more chapters. You know what He said? Uh, would you like to follow me? Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first... Would you like to follow me? Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first. Would you, in the same book, the same book of Luke, Dr. Luke wrote it. Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first. I'm not ready now. Oh, I'm ready to be a follower. I'm ready to let people know I'm a follower. Just don't inconvenience me. Not now. Yeah, now. If the Lord were to ring the dinner bell, would you say, I'm ready? Secondly, and I'm almost done. Have you let your loved ones know you're ready for the dinner bell to ring? So if the dinner bell rings and you get that stinking phone call, three o'clock in the morning, so-and-so fell, so-and-so passed, so-and-so got run over, so-and-so, did they know that, hey, it didn't have to come by the house to check him and me. They were ready for the dinner bell. Do your family know that? Yes. Do they know you're ready if that's what happens? Preacher, that's kind of morbid. Yeah, but ladies and gentlemen, if we don't live like we are dying, we are of all men most miserable. Amen. What's the point? Amen. Amen. I'm ready. If supper's ready, he's re he's the one that's got it ready. I like to eat it when it's hot. I mean, I don't like it so hot that you put it in your mouth and it burns holes in you. You know, you bite into a decent pizza and they got that cheese so hot that it sticks to your mouth and then you pull it off. Now the pizza's no good anymore. It tastes like blood. Because it doesn't rip the insides out of your mouth. That'll ruin a good meal in a heartbeat, man. Kind of like, man... This is bad, but I, but I do like... Food has a... It's an enhanced flavor when it's hot. Now, you may be different than me. I don't like cold soup. That's supposed to be something like rich people like. I guess that's why I don't like it. But, but soup to me says hot. You know, this is cold soup. We'll put it in the oven. Put it back in the pot. Put it in the microwave. For the Lord's sake. I don't want no cold soup. They call that jello. <laughs> but I learned this from a chef food heated to the proper temperature enhances the flavor of the food you're about to eat it brings out the best in the food I'm like pretty good but if you're late and the dinner's cold the experience that the people have from eating the hot food will be entirely different from you that eats leftovers after it's cold. Some people don't care for leftovers at all. You just well throw them in the garbage can. But you know what I do know about leftovers? They taste almost as good as they did when you first got them as long as you reheat them first. And it brings back the memories of the first time you sat down and had them. If the Lord calls for supper, He wants to serve it while it tastes the best. And us having to stop by and check in and check on stuff before we get there. It takes away from the enhancement of the flavors. And we miss the best that He prepared for us because we weren't ready when He whistled. I want to ask you a question. I'm going to close. If the Lord saw fit today 
And you're saved. Praise the Lord. Glad you're saved. But I'm talking beyond just being saved. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting older. We're going to experience more and more of saints departing. We're not in control of the timeline. The Lord chooses when to whistle for His saints. The issue is not for you to determine which saints you're ready to see go. The issue is, are you ready to go? Or will you make an excuse? Lord, I'd like to, but first. Lord, I appreciate the opportunity, but first. Lord, I know, I promised you, I'd come to supper. I told you that. But between when I promised that and now, something more important than having supper with you has gotten in the way. Think about this and I'm done. What could be more important than having supper with the Savior? What if your place at the table is directly related to whether or not you're ready when He calls?